organized by the New Hall Art Collection and the Mary Edwards College MCR. My name is Janet and I'm the representative from the MCR this evening. For those of you who are not from the Cambridge University community, the MCR stands for Main Common Room and we are a body of elected representatives to, um, from the postgraduate student community. Because of the pandemic, we've had to take you on this tour via Zoom, although it is also available as a stream on YouTube under the Mary Edwards College YouTube channel right now. So before we start, I would just like to provide a little background to this event. We had conceived this event as an in-person tour that we would like to take place physically in our college in Cambridge. And we were running preparations for this tour back in February with the intention of fundraising for Stephen Lawrence Day that was on April the 22nd. And so given this background, we've decided to continue with our original design, which is to fundraise for charities such as the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust. Following the racist killing of George Floyd in the US in May, which drew worldwide attention to the institutional racism and racial violence as an ongoing issue in modern day society, we believe it is all the more important to support charities doing important work in empowering and uplifting Black communities and people of color, whether through education, the arts, or the law. And this is why we have selected five charities to spotlight. The first one is the Stephen Lawrence Charitable Trust, which supports young people to achieve their potential through education, career coaching, and scholarships. Also using education as a tool for empowerment is our second charity, Mosaic, which supports young refugees to access universities. The third charity is the Ethiopian Women's Empowerment Group. They're based in North Kensington and have provided ongoing support to the local community in healing from the trauma inflicted by the Grenfell tragedy. The fourth charity is Black Table Arts. They're based in Minneapolis in the US and Black Table Arts' mission is to raise volume in Black life through the arts. The Because Black Life um, Conference organized by them is going to take place next week. And finally, Inquest UK is the fifth charity we'd like to mention. Inquest is the only charity in the UK that is dedicated to helping bereaved people whose family members suffered in state-related deaths to pursue justice. We hope that you will show your support by making a donation, whether it is large or small, through this uh, after this event. I will put a link in the chat box, which contains all the online donation links to all of the five charities I mentioned. Now, let me introduce the speakers and program for tonight. Our first speaker will be Harriet Lovler. Harriet is our lovely curator of the New Hall Art Collection. She was also previously curated at the Norwich Castle Museum and Art Gallery. She also worked at the Fries Art Fair in London and in MoMA in New York. Harriet will give you an introduction and guide you through our college. A big shout out to Sebastian Goldwyn who edited these footages for us that you'll be seeing tonight. This will then be followed by a discussion with our second and third speakers, Anastasia Kolomietz and Alayo Akinkabe. Anastasia is a history of art undergraduate at Fitzwilliam College here at Cambridge. She is a member of the Decolonized History of Art student-led activist group and serves on the art editorial team of the Mace 2020. The Mace 2020 is an anthology of short stories, poetry, photo, and art from Cambridge and Oxford students. Alayo is a student of art undergraduate at the Gonville and Keys College. She runs the Instagram account, A Black History of Art, which highlights the overlooked Black artists, sitters, curators, and thinkers from art history and the present day. She's also a member of the Decolonized History of Art Activist Group and an art editorial member at the Mace 2020. We will finish with a Q&A, so please send in your questions at any time throughout the talk in the chat box and we will answer them. So now without further ado, I will pass the time to Harriet. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, I'm just going to share my screen so uh, you can see what I'm looking at. Okay, so thank you Janet so much. I hope you can all hear me as well. Um, so what is the Newhall Art Collection? So uh, the Newhall Art Collection is a permanent collection of modern and contemporary art by women at Murray Edwards College, which is part of the University of Cambridge. It is the largest collection of its kind in Europe and the second largest in the world. It was started by women, celebrates art made by women in a Cambridge college dedicated to the education of outstanding young women. 
So I'm going to just give you a very brief overview of the collection um, to kind of set the scene really for, for this talk. So New Hall was established in 1954 by Dame Rosemary Murray as a college for women at a time when Cambridge University had the lowest proportion of female undergraduates of any university in the UK. Um, and her name, alongside that of the Edwards family, who generously endowed the college in 2008, makes up the now named Murray Edwards College. So over the years, the college needed to expand and a purpose built college was built um, by uh, the kind of incredible architects. I really feel that uh, Dame Rosemary Murray was totally inspired in her choice of architects, which were Chamberlain Bonham and Powell, who in 1964 built this and then went on to build the Barbican Centre in London. And it really is, um, it was conceived very much as a manifesto for the education of women. So for the architects and for Rosemary Murray, there's very much this kind of emphasis on ascension. And they felt very strongly that education should be transformational. And so um, we have this very iconic dome in which you are very much in, in kind of encouraged to look up and thereby aim high. The collection is uh, displayed all across the college. So you can see the dome in uh, part of this image. Here we're in the kind of lower fountain court where you have these wonderful pots that are normally bursting with these incredible dinner plate dahlias at this time of year. Um, and the collection is, as you can sort of see um, through into the bar, it's very much kind of everywhere. It's in the staff offices, it's in the accommodation blocks. So wherever you are in the college, you will always be in the company of work by women. But really the story about the collection starts with this wonderful woman, uh, Dr. Valerie Pearl, who was um, president of the college from 1981 to 1995. And she was absolutely instrumental in appointing the American feminist artist, Mary Kelly, as the first artist in residence at Newhall and nearby Kettles Yard. And it was during this residency in 1985 that they formed a friendship. And you can see um, these sort of monochrome photo laminate images, which are part of Mary Kelly's uh, series called Extas, which very much charts the kind of experience of women's lives um, since the women's kind of liberation movement in the 1970s. And this edition was kind of made specifically for for the college and became the sort of foundational artwork. It became the kind of nucleus of the collection. So after this uh, acquisition was made, uh, Valerie Pearl and uh, the curator Anne Jones set about building a collection and they set about assembling a list of 100 uh, influential, inspiring women artists. This is in the early 90s. And they asked for donations and I think they assumed they would get about 25 but they got an astonishing 75. And amongst those artists were Paula Brago and Maggie Hambling and indeed Maud Salter and Labena Himid, who we will hear more about um, in due course. And as well as being a kind of collection, 90% of which is on uh, display, we also organise uh, events. And this was a remarkable event with uh, Frida Kahlo from the feminist activist collective, uh, the Gorilla Girls, who came to Murray Edwards to give one of their incredibly impassioned lectures. Um, and then more recently, we worked with Linda Sterling and Kettles Yard on a phenomenal kind of performance, a sort of dance collage um, in the dome that took place literally on the cusp of lockdown. So it really did feel like a kind of, it gave it a, a kind of incredible charge. We also organize exhibitions. So this is an installation image of the Femfolio exhibition, uh, the 20 works on paper that Alayu will go on to speak about that include work by Emma Amos and Faith Ringgold. Before I sort of hand over and finish, I want to just mention uh, generosity because whenever I talk about the collection, wherever I am, I always bring this up because it seems to run through everything. Um, it is in the spirit of the place. And I'm showing you these images of the, of the gardens because um, the garden is so central, I think, to this idea of generosity because the gardener, Jo Cobb, she allows the staff and the students uh, to pick the flowers and the foliage and the fruit from these gardens. And we are also, um, we're not 
in the pandemic, we're open to the public every day and we really hope to be opening towards the end of the year and all of the works have been donated. So I feel that generosity is central and um, I am very grateful to uh, Anastasia and Elia for being um, for giving their time and their, their thoughts to this event. So um, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Elia. Thank you very much, Harriet. Um, so I'm going to start by talking about the works of Faith Ringgold and the late Emma Amos, both of whom feature in the Newhall Art Collection through the Fembolio. And then Anastasia will talk about Maud Salter and Lubena Hineed's works in the collection. So the Fembolio is a portfolio of 19 digital prints and one lithograph, editions of which are held in ma major museum collections around the world and um, it brings together the work of 20 women artists who were influential in the 1970s femi feminist art movement in the US. And it was donated to the Newhall Art Collection by Marjorie Marte, who commented, and I quote, as an advocate for women artists and personally passionate about the Newhall Art Collection, I felt the portfolio would be a significant addition to this collection. Femfolio represents an important period of the feminist culture in the 1970s. So I'm now going to start my PowerPoint. So um, I'm going to start by focusing on Emma Amos's work, um, Identity 2006. And this is a video showing how it is displayed in the collection. And we apologize for the handheld quality of the video but it's useful to get an idea of how the work is displayed. Um, and obviously we could do this in person if not for Corona. Um, so the work is a self portrait created using digital print and hand lithography. And to, to clarify, litho lithography is a printing process that uses a flat stone or metal plate on which the image areas are worked using a greasy substance so that the ink will adhere to them and the non-image areas are made ink repellent. The image includes several emblems on Amos's hair, such as outlines of hands and eyes, whilst her face is split in half, with a darker complexion on one side and a lighter on the other, referring to the nuances of race and identity. This is a common feature in Amos's works. Um, in one instance, we have um, All I Know of Wonder, 2008, where we see that she changes, she uses a range of colors to depict different parts of her body. Um, in the same way, referring to the nuances of race and complexion and the spectrum of race. Um, and you can see that particularly here in the legs. Um, and I want to kind of contextualize her life and explain her involvement in the 1970s feminist art movement so that we can better understand why she was selected to be in the Fembolio. Um, so Emma Amos was born in Atlanta, Georgia in 1937 and she sadly died earlier this year, aged 83, as a result of complications with Alzheimer's. Um, Amos was initially skeptical about feminism. Um, she said, the experiences of black women of any class were left out. I came from a line of working women who were not only mothers, but breadwinners, cultured, educated, and who had been treated as equals by their black husbands. I felt I could not afford to spend, spend precious time away from studio and family to listen to stories so far removed from my own. The focus of this talk is on her engagement with feminism in particular, but I think it is worth mentioning her involvement in Spiral prior to the feminist groups that she joined later in her career. So Spiral was an all-male art group until Emma Amos joined, age 23, and it was founded with the aim of featuring the works of African-American artists Spiral was also closely allied with the civil rights movement, but Amos felt somewhat isolated by being the only female member. Spiral had only one exhibition in May 1965 and was eventually dissolved in 1967 after losing their gallery to rising rent prices in 1965, after which Amos struggled to exhibit her work. In 1974, Amos became an instructor in textile design at Newark School of Fine and Industrial Arts and she did her own weaving alongside this, which coincided with the new interest in women's traditional art forms during the feminist art movement. Amos said of weaving that she certainly knew not to admit that I was a weaver because people held it against me. It was just a smart thing to keep your mouth sh shut and not to admit it. 
because of the perception of weaving as low art amongst fine art circles and the association of women artists working with fabric as being no more than artisans. So she was also involved in two feminist art groups, um, Heresies and Fantastic Women in the Arts. Um, Amos went to the meetings of the group Fantastic Women in the Arts, um, which explored the work of female artists, particularly female artists of colour. And the group also focused on how the revolutions of second wave feminism in the arts had made little difference for black women. The group discussed the overt privilege of white Americans in the arts, as well as in everyday life. Amos mentioned discrimination that she faced as a result of her Southern accent as well in the art, in the art world, which was not the case for her white Northern counterparts, saying, the assumption that you were unlearned was very painful. Amos joined the Heresies Collective in, 19, in the early 1980s, and this was while she was teaching at Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University in New Jersey. Heresies was a group founded by feminist artists to observe art from, fe from feminist and political perspectives, and it oversaw the publication of the journal Heresies, a feminist publication on art and politics that existed from 1977 to 1993. The group consisted of women from a range of backgrounds that published artwork and writing of unknown women artists and published artwork and writing of unknown women artists. And Amos stated, and that's what heresies became for me. All of my disdain for white feminists disappeared because we were all in the same boat. We just came to the boat from different spaces. So now moving on to Faith Ringgold's work in the Femfolio. Um, there we go. Um, so this work is Coming to Jones Road Under a Blood Red Sky, um, number eight, 2007. And it is a digital print with lithography, like Emma Amos's print. Um, and it is part of a, number, a series of a number of prints with the same name made in the early 2000s, all of which feature figures on a red background and incorporate natural imagery, trees, flowers, etc and there is a general narrative of journeying and mass movement. So Faith Ringgold's birth name was Faith Willie Jones, hence the title Coming to Jones Road suggests an autobiographical influence. She is descended from a working class family that was displaced by the Great Migration, and the theme of journeying is prevalent in the works of this title. We see only a silhouette of the figures in the distance along the yellow path, just slightly to the left of the central axis. Ringgold fav favors anonymity over identification. Hence, we do not get an indication of who the figures are, only that they are figures. She says, what I really am is a people painter. So I do people that are people because I don't want people to say, oh, that's Martin Luther King or, some or somebody. It isn't someone else, it's you. Um, so Faith Ringgold's, I'm going to talk a bit about her style and um, her style as a storyteller because she frequently incorporates text into her work and she has also written children's books. This work is very much archetypal of her 90s oeuvre, which consists of several acry acrylic paintings bordered with storytelling text. The work seems to have certain biographical influences and it's kind of influenced by the socio-political context of the first few decades of Faith Ringgold's life. Her parents, Andrew Louis Jones and Willie Posey Jones, descended from working class fam families displaced by the Great Migration. The notion of migration is prevalent throughout her life, and the migration, the Great Migration or the Black Migration, was the movement of six million African Americans out of the southern states of the United, southern United States to the urban Northeast, Midwest and West that occurred between 1916 and 1970. So that dominates the first four decades of Faith Ringgold's life. Um, she also lived in Harlem as a child and she was born in 1930, just after the Harlem Renaissance. And the Harlem Renaissance was an intellectual, social and artistic explosion centered in Harlem, New York City. And it spanned the 1920s. And at the time it was known as the New Negro Movement and the name Harlem Renaissance comes retrospectively. 
Um, the movement also included the new African-American cultural expressions across the urban areas in the Northeast and Midwest of the US affected by the Great Migration. Har Harlem was just the largest that was affected. So thinking about the feminist aspects of this work, um, we can interpret some feminist social co commentary by analyzing the text. Aunt Emmy could be in two places at the same time and Uncle Tate could vanish, vanish in a flash and turn up in the same way. One day they just up and walk to freedom and nobody see him go. Aunt, the idea of Aunt Emmy being in two places at one time is interesting because Faith Ringgold often has women as her protagonists. She praises the character with the notion of being in two places at one time um, and she kind of suggests a superpower and highlights the strength and the ability of women. More pertinent than the feminist aspects of the work, though, are the references to slavery. Um, the series of Coming to Jones Road Under a Blood Red Sky is based on the Underground Railroad and the journey of escaped slaves to freedom. The phrase in the text also speaks to the idea of an escape, the, the phrase that says, nobody see him go. And the Underground Ra Railroad was a network of secret routes and safe houses established in the US during the early to mid 19th century. And it was used by enslaved African-Americans to escape into free states and to Canada. Um, so I'm gonna just focus quickly on um, Faith Ringgold's style and her use of color. Um, she has cited Tibetan paintings as one of her inspirations and the color palette of um, Coming to Jones Road definitely reflects this and perhaps the flatness of the composition too, as well as the strong sense of a narrative or journey through the natural world. Um, we see in this, in Coming to Jones Road, um, the red sky kind of evokes an uncertainty and a danger or a fear, and the White House seems like a symbol of safety. And this is where the path leads to um, a safe house um, and the yellow road kind of evokes the idea of a yellow brick road or the idea of positive positivity and hope and also brought to my mind the notion of somewhere where the paths are paved with gold um, and the vivid colors and the minimal blending creates a kind of uncertainty and eeriness to the print and it's almost kind of overwhelming so i'm now going to hand over to anastasia um, to talk about Maud Salter and Lubaina Hamid. So let me just stop the screen to share. Right. Um, thank you so much, Alayo. Now I'm going to talk about the late Maud Salter and Lubaina Hamid. Let me just get my slides up. There we go. So they're both very incredible and very important British Black women artists. Salter was a Scottish artist, poet, writer, curator, art historian, and publisher. She was born in Glasgow in 1960 of Scottish and Ghanaian descent. Um, sadly, she died in 2008 after a long illness. So this is Salter on the left. And Himid um, on the right is an artist, curator, writer, and art historian. She was born in Zanzibar in 1954 but she moved to the UK with her mother when she was just four months old. In their practice, they both focus on and champion Black people's, especially Black women's experiences, creativity and places in history and culture. So they're counteracting erasure and the silencing of Black historical and contemporary figures, which especially affects Black women and women of colour in a cultural landscape that tends to be male dominated and white centric. Sultan and Himid were prominent members of, I mean, prominent figures in the British black arts movement in the 1960s. Himid emerged as one of the leaders of the movement. In the 60s, she organized three seminal exhibitions um, of works by black women artists in London. This is a view of one of them, perhaps the most kind of influential one. It was the thin black line at the ICA, 85 to 86. So the exhibitions really brought radical black women artists to prominence in the British art world. The two artists were friends during Solda's lifetime and they worked on many projects together. 
a lot of their collaborations focus on black women artists and championing kind of their identity and their creativity. For example, they credited the book Passion, Discourses in Black Women's Creativity in 1990, which was the first book published in Britain to be dedicated to acknowledging and celebrating black women artists. So now I'm going to start, oh, and this is Lubei Nehimid in 2017 um, in front of her installation, A Fashionable Marriage. So 2017 was when she won the Turner Prize. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with Maud Salter's Falia, portrait of Alice Walker. So this is the dome, which is really the centerpiece of the architecture of the college. And it's kind of like really occupying space. It's this huge photographic work that is very vibrant and that is really kind of joyfully announced seeing its presence. In the photograph we see Alice Walker standing against a plain off-white backdrop holding a huge bucket of yellow, red and white flowers that's almost about to burst into our space. Solta used cybochrome printing which was one of the newest kind of innovations in photography at the time. It was really good for its vibrant colours so she used it to really capture the saturation the vibrancy but also the clarity of the colors so yes we have this very joyful very present work in the space this is part of a larger series called zabad made in 1989 in this series Salter photographed nine black women creatives as the nine greek muses so here are just some examples so in fact, Lubei Nehimid was included in the series as well. Here she is as the muse Urania, muse of astronomy. And this is Delta Street as Terpsihori, muse of dance. And Maud Salter also did an autoportrait. This is her as Calliope, muse of epic poetry, because of course she's a poet. But also here she's presenting herself as Jeanne Duval, who is an actress, I mean, who was an actress, dancer, and also the muse and lover of Baudelaire. So Zabat was originally commissioned by the Rochdale Art Gallery to mark the 150th anniversary of the invention of photography. With her series, Solta was directly addressing the invisibility of black figures at such celebratory dates and just broadly in the history of photography and visual culture. She said that it is important for me as an individual and obviously as a black woman artist to put black women back into the center of the frame, both literally within the photographic image, but also in the cultural institutions where our work operates. And basically Zabad is doing exactly that. This series is called Zabad. Zabad is a word created or invented by Maud Solta. It has three meanings that all kind of interact with each other. So the first meaning is sacred dance performed by groups of 13. It also can mean an occasion of power, which is the possible origin of the witches Sabbath. And thirdly, it can also mean black women's rights, rite of passage in 18th dynasty ancient Egypt. So essentially from these three meanings and their interaction, we get the sense that Zabad is really about black women's power. In this specific work, we see Alice Walker, the award-winning writer, winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for her novel, The Color Purple, um, also activist and a womanist. So a very, very important kind of cultural and societal figure. She is pictured as Thalia, I mean, as Thalia, the muse of comedy, but the artwork is deliberately mistitled after town in Ghana to show the interconnectedness between European and African cultures and geographies, something that's like not really talked about in history a lot and that dates all the way back to antiquity. The bouquet, which I already mentioned, creates this very celebratory feel, but it's also reference to Alice Walker's womanist theory. So Alice Walker coined the term 
womanist, which means a black feminist or a feminist of color, and her 1983 collection of essays titled In Search of Our Mother's Gardens. And in general, to explain womanism, she kind of used a lot of garden-related metaphors. So one of the most famous metaphors she uses to explain the intersectionality and universalism of womanism is by comparing it to a garden where different flowers bloom equally and differently. So the Bucky is also kind of a reference to, you know, her cultural and societal impact, her output. It's important to note that what you see is not just kind of how Maud Salter envisaged the, the final product to be, it's actually the result of a collaboration between the model and the artist and kind of collaborative mode of working was very important to Salter as an artist in general. Also, Alice Walker is named, which is very important because this important black woman figure is given an explicit identity within cultural history, something that has generally been historically denied. This all is especially important, given that Mozart is using conventions of Victorian 19th century portrait photography. Um, so we see uh, the figure inside a photographer's studio, there, there are props being used. Also, most figures in Zabat, as you can see, have kind of seated poses, which was another very prominent convention in Victorian portrait photography. However, the I mean, Victorian portrait photography was also known for kind of um, being produced by white male photographers who didn't really give the model a say in how they would like to be presented. And this especially affected black women and women of color who, whose identity was frequently erased by not naming them in their photograph, but also who were frequently misrepresented by like exoticizing them or hypersexualizing them. So Salter disrupts this convention and the unequal power dynamics within it by naming her subjects, giving them center stage and control over how they want to be represented. And this is also very, very important because this then creates a historic record within visual culture, within the, the history of photography that, you know, gives black women the power to represent themselves, that does not distort, that creates a narrative that is more complete and representative. Another very important um, feature of this whole series and this work in particular is the kind of views of muses, mythology and imagery. Muses in ancient Greek mythology are female deities that patron the arts by inspiring people to be creative. They're conventionally represented as white women and they're also fairly passive because even though they're deities and have divine power, the way they act through the world is through another person, so an artist, a singer, a musician. Maud Salter is um, also disrupting this convention. The women in her works are both inspired by the muses to create, but also are the muses themselves. In this way, Maud Salter not only is repositioning Black women within kind of um, that history and those cultural conventions that are normally whitewashed but she also empowers them and in a way her muses her figures are much more powerful than the original ancient greek muses because now they, they actually have agency in this world because they're cultural producers and this kind of disrupts sexism as well as racism at the core of dominant Western cultural conventions. So I personally think that by using Western visual conventions and framing real contemporary Black women figures within them, Salter is doing three main things. So first, she's highlighting the presence of Black women cultural producers and hence their impact on culture. She's also highlighting the absence of Black women creatives from how history is generally taught, perceived and recorded. And these together mean that Salter is showing that this narrative of exclusion is, first of all, not true and incomplete, but also 
it can be disrupted. She shows that there's power to change this, to ultimately create a new and more complete and more representative narrative. So on this amazing note, <laughs> like, I don't know, on this note, I'm going to move on to Yubaina Himid. So these are the two works by her in the collection. As Harriet said, in Spinster Souls collection on the left was donated in the 90s. And then Sour Grapes on the right was donated in 2015. So they're both um, kind of paintings on canvas. Nubei Nehemet uses um, a range of media. She does painting not only on canvas, but also on paper and found objects. She's also very well known for her signature cutout figures that form set-like installations. Um, in her work, she explores the way Black people are represented or misrepresented, not represented at all in narratives in Western art history and exposes as well as fills in these gaps. She says her works are there to open up conversation. And this is something that I think these two works really, really do um, like really well. So they're both from the Wing Museum series, which was as originally exhibited as an installation titled The Bad of the Wing at Chisinau Gallery in London in 1989. So here's a view just of you know, one corner of the exhibition slash installation. And you can actually see in Spinster Salt's collection kind of on the right um, in the corner there. This is a touring, um, imaginary touring exhibition of black cultural objects comprised of paintings like the ones you see on the walls and the ones in the New Hall Art Collection, but also three-dimensional objects put on plinth. You can see them in this photograph as well. The series does two things. It celebrates black creativity and cultural production, while at the same time, being critique of the Western style museum as an institution, especially in relation to the treatment of black cultural objects. In Himid's words, it's an homage to black creativity and a critique of theft and denial. The original Chisinau gallery installation was actually accompanied by an audio and film um, recording of Maud Salter singing The Bad of the Wing, which she composed specifically for this exhibition. So kind of even in this work, we see the traces of them collaborating and working really closely together, which is amazing. So Himmet said that like in a ballad, the objects in this installation, it can all be read together as a ballad or separately as verses. So when there is kind of one object, it is so it kind of autonomous, self-contained, but also when there is another object from the same series, they kind of bounce off of each other and inform and expand each other's meanings. So I'm going, oh, and this is the wing, which is um, the, the installation was kind of based off the legend of the wing and is what the museum was named after. Um, and this is from Chisinau. Right, so I'm going to talk about In Spinster Souls collection first. It's currently on loan to the Heian Gallery for the exhibition We Are Here, but normally it would be hung up in the dome, which is the same kind of centerpiece space as Maud Salter's work is hung up in. So this is actually a huge canvas. It's six by six feet. The imagery here is fairly simple, even stripped down. The objects are delineated in black, so it's, it's very, very laconic. The objects are painted as if they're in a museum case somewhere. They're numbered and classified. The numbers 2, 11 and 7 are not in order, so it's kind of like recalling um, a museum cabinet somewhere where you'd have to like look at the appropriate number to find out about an object and then there'd be like a huge label that kind of groups all the objects together under each each number and then hopefully if if you're lucky you'll find out some information but normally it's just kind of the name of the object given by the museum um maybe like a date and maybe like a sentence about it so already it's critiquing the way that Black cultural objects are normally displayed in Western museums. 
Also the inscription, the inscription at the top right corner is very important. Um, so it kind of suggests that these objects used to be in a private collection together. And to me, this refers to how much influence like powerful, wealthy individuals, many of whom either benefited from imperialism and colonialism or were directly involved in it, uh, how much say they had in um, the creation of national collections and how they kind of like amateur way of collecting, how much that influenced public museums afterwards as they were giving their work. So it's all about how like the, the representation of like creativity and African diaspora culture proposed by the museums seems almost arbitrary, but also kind of has colonial origins um, a lot of the time. So the three objects are actually ancient Egyptian objects. Two and 11 on the left are a pair of sistra. These are musical instruments used for a variety of purposes, but most commonly in worship. And seven is a mirror. Um, you might not think that these objects are like related in any way, but actually sistra and mirrors were used um, in the worship of the Egyptian cow goddess Hatha. So even though the objects are related, the way they're put together isn't, isn't great. The cabinet of curious way in which they're displayed means a complex heterogeneous culture and objects each from like a different locality, perhaps a different time from a different maker and an owner are lumped together and expected to stand in, so to speak, for the whole culture. So this very essentializing way of displaying cultural objects that presents ancient Egypt as a static and generalized entity. The objects are also anonymous, which is another very important thing about them. So um, whereas Western art objects would normally be treated by museums in terms of kind of their maker, their owner, the history of usage and the history of ownership. Here, the objects are completely anonymized and once again, expected to just stand in for the culture without any consideration of like specificity or detail. Um, so the museum, even though it posits itself as a good means of preserving and disseminating knowledge, its historical record of black creativity is flawed and distorted. This kind of brings to prominence what I think is the central um, focus of this whole series, the contrast between literal presence, like the fact of having existed that these objects are, versus their presence in like memorization and how history is taught. So while the object can be there, the knowledge about them is kind of not really there. Something that him had called a condition of being there, but not always there. So this theme of presences and absences. The same theme is touched upon in sour grapes. So here we see again inside the dome, there we go. You can really see the size of the artwork from here. It's also six foot by six foot. As you can see, it's right opposite Mod Salter's um, Falia. So here the imagery is also very simplified, but it's even more stripped down. It's a huge pink, pink canvas and um, the imagery is just outlined in black with no tonal variation. In the top left corner, we see something that appears to be a grape. And then in the top right corner, there's a squiggle that's almost unclear what it means until you recognize that it's about the fable about the grapes and the fox. And you recognize this from kind of also the title Sour Grapes because it's such an auspicious saying. So here we have the ancient fable teller and composer Aesop being represented not through himself as a historical figure, but through his fables. So the simplicity of the image almost means that it becomes like a literal symbol for him. The whole figure of Aesop is wrapped in myth. He kind of oscillates between myth and history, between presence and absence. And it's not, it's not really clear if he existed. 
No writing by Aesop himself survives, but there are a lot of animal fables that are credited to him and have been collected like throughout the ages. So to me, this also really brings out this condition of being there, but not always there. Aesop is kind of present, but also he is not necessarily con considered to be a part of conventional history, even though his fables live on. So this kind of condition of being there, but not always there, um, almost depends on what gets recorded, taught, showcased, and talked about. There is also a debate in academia about whether Aesop was a black man of Ethiopian origin or not. Some theories claim that he was, citing as evidence that his name was derived from the Greek for Ethiopian, and there are also others who disagree with this. But to me, even the presence, like the, the fact that this debate exists, just shows kind of the erasure and also the whitewashing of history. It's almost like a historic black figure, like almost needs to have been proven to be black. Like the default assumption is that people, especially people from antiquity and like people who are prominent in Western like history are white. So that's another kind of aspect of this work. In fact, um, the reductive kind of imagery of this work and the fact that you might only recognize that it's referring, referencing Aesop by the title Sour Grapes and through how auspicious the saying is, it really showcases the fragility of knowledge. And to be all this combined then opens up these questions about um, how how do we ensure that objects are then present and present? They're not, not just there and but not always there, but that they are present both both in themselves but also in the historic evidence. How do we recover the gaps? How do we fill the gaps? How many gaps there exist? And kind of like all these questions about history and record, and especially how this relates to um, black creativity and black people. But yeah, that's it for me. Thank you so much. I'm going to end the demonstration. Thank you so much to um, Elio and Anastasia for your kind of precise and really detailed kind of thoughts about the work of Emma Amos, Faith Ringgold, Labena Himid, and Maud Salter. Thank you so much. So I am going to. Um, open up to questions from people um, in the waiting, not in the waiting room, I hope you're all with us. Um, <laughs> any, any, any questions? Um, okay, so we have one for here from Sarah Greaves saying, women's art often examines the idea of the male gaze. Do you think that the work by black women artists considered the, considers the white gaze as well as the male gaze? So maybe that is a question for both of you to answer mm -hmm. about the, the artists. Who would like to, to go first? Um, I think that particularly when you look at um, the Maud Salter picture that Anastasia was just talking about, you can mm -hmm. see an addressing of the white gaze. I think that's why the flowers are included. I think that's why there's a huge gold frame because it's kind of saying this is the way that white males have done portraiture and I'm kind of, you know, she's, I feel like Maud Salter is kind of addressing that by using the conventions of, um, Yeah, like reclaiming yeah. Victorian poetry photography, that would basically yeah. normally be yeah. an embodiment of the white gaze, but, you know, reclaiming that and repositioning it. Um, yeah, typically. Yeah. Cool. And I think um, something that was raised bef before um, between us was that um, it's really symbolic that that particular work sits within the dining room of the college, which, um, you know, traditionally the more historic Cambridge colleges, if you enter the dining room, you will be faced with mm. portraits of white men. And so um, it's a shame that kind of Maud Salter wasn't able to kind of, well, maybe, I don't know actually like how long that, photograph has been hanging actually in the dome whether or not she she saw it there because I f it feels really symbolic and actually one of my projects and I, I I'm at risk of sort of sharing this because I feel but it's also really good it gives me a bit of jeopardy 
one thing I would love to do is to assemble all um, nine of the photographs in the dome. And the only place that has them is the V&A in London. And the challenge that we have is that we have food and environment and light and all of the things that museums would be uh, very carefully scrutinizing when assessing a kind of loan like that. But um, I really hope that maybe we could kind of generate lots of support to make that happen um, because it's something I would really love to see, um, seeing the whole series kind of assembled. I think mm. it would be really incredible. Um, does anyone have any more questions about any of the artists that were discussed or? I was, I was sent one that says, are there other black women artists in this collection, perhaps less well-known black women artists, but I think that these are the four black women artists in the collection. Right? Well, there are more women of color and actually um, Anastasia did a fantastic survey of the artists of color in the collection. Um, quite a few months ago, Anastasia. Mm. Maybe you could talk yeah. about what that um, process was like and, and the, right. the kind of questions that it drew up because it was <laughs> it was not without kind of questions, wasn't it? Yeah, oh, 100%. So I can't remember specifically about other Black women artists that um, like um, I found out about through that research. But what that research for me really brought out is um, kind of how almost like malleable the categories are and like race is a construct that was created historically for a very specific and like really horrible purpose but I just feel like it's like just I don't know I feel like it's something that people should I don't know have a I don't know how to phrase this, but basically when I'm researching, sometimes it's really hard to tell by like the appearance and it's kind of like it really brought to mind how actually the whole topic of race and ethnicity is like much more complex. Um, but I was really lucky in um, there being the database, um, Black Artists and Modernism, um, which is a research project, project headed by Sonia Boyce, who was also like she still isn't like a very influential artist, but she was very important in the 80s British Black Arts Movement. And she created this amazing database of Black artists and artists of color in British public collections. So yeah, something to definitely check out and keep in mind. Thank you. So I'm just gonna do a quick time check. Okay, so we have three minutes and um, I know Alaya has got another event at half past seven with Untangling the Knot and IGTV Live. So um, that's something to very much kind of encourage you all to, to attend. So I think that's probably on all the questions we have time for. And I know that Janet just wants to say. Yeah, so thank you so much for our panelists, for Harriet for sharing the discussion and Anastasia Alayo for sharing your thoughts tonight. So just one last one last mention would be to visit our link, which I'm going to send now. It is a page that we've created that contains all the donation links um, that you can easily access um, to donate to after this event, which we hope you'll enthusiastically support. Um, we also hope you've enjoyed tonight and good night and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for participating. <laughs>